Do you remember those magic eye pictures? They were a fad in the early to mid-90s. Each picture appeared to be only repetitive blotches of color on the flat page. However, the image was printed in such a way that when your eyes relaxed and you were not looking directly at the surface, a three-dimensional image emerged. If you want to look at pictures like that, you can search under magic eye and you will find lots of them. The technical term for this type of drawing is called autostereogram. There are two images superimposed one on another, and they are like stereo music, which reaches both your ears and helps you identify the position of the players. The effect of stereo recording is meant to be more like a live performance, just as seeing things which are live are also seen in three dimensions. The reason magic eye pictures work is because you have two eyes. Although they can each focus on a different image, your brain joins them together into a single image, which seems to pop off the page in three dimensions. If you had only one eye, this would not be possible. The Bible has a similar function. If you can set one eye on the events of the ancient past, the events of the forefathers, and the other eye on the future, the warnings of the prophets and their fulfillment, then the words on the page will suddenly come to life. As we see prophecy fulfilled, we realize that the thing that hath been, it is that which shall be, and that which is done is that which shall be done, and there is no new thing under the sun as Solomon wrote in Ecclesiastes 1.9. There is a continuous cycle to all life, represented, presented, and foretold by the Lord of the universe. The Word is alive. As it is written in John 1.14, And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And again in 1 John 1.1, 1, 1, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled, of the word of life. And again in John six sixty three, Yeshua said, The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. Nevertheless, the people were offended by his words, and many left on account of the things that he said. He asked the disciples if they would also leave. But in verse 68, Simon Peter answers, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Because Yeshua was from times past, and because he will return in times future, he can be alive and incarnate. He can be among us in events. The stereo-optical viewing of events bears witness to this fact. Another salient point about the magic eye is that it causes you to relax. It even puts your brain waves into an alpha state. In ordinary circumstances, alpha waves are associated with wakeful relaxation and closed eyes. They are thought to play an active role in network coordination and communication. Prayer and spiritual reflection will also cause you to achieve this alpha wave state. There is another optical phenomenon that gives depth to our understanding of the Bible. When I was a young girl, my family took a trip to Washington, D.C. In one of the museums, there was a display of a hologram. It was a very new science. There was a green apple, apparently made out of light, hanging in midair. You could walk all the way around it, and it appeared in three dimensions. Holography had been invented in 1947, and I was at the Smithsonian about 15 years after that. Of course, today the science of holography is advanced. It is used in virtual reality presentations and in education. In 2007, Al Gore was holographically beamed in to attend the live Earth event in Tokyo, an event staged to raise awareness of global warming. In 2018, visitors at the Intrepid Sea, Air, and Space Museum on the Hudson River in New York could come face to face with a hologram of Mae Jemison, the first African-American woman in space. Located beneath the Space Shuttle Enterprise, the new Mixed Reality Experience used Microsoft HoloLens headsets to lead visitors on a journey through the history of trailblazing women at NASA and a holographic tour of the inside of the Space Shuttle with Jemison as the tour guide. A hologram is a three-dimensional projection 
that exists freely in space and is created using lasers and light. The projected light produces bright, immersive 3D images that can be viewed simultaneously by multiple people from different angles, all in true perspective. It is a real-world recording of an interference pattern which uses diffraction to reproduce the 3D light field. It results in an image which has depth and parallax, the phenomenon that the position or direction of an object appears to change when viewed from different positions. If you walk around the hologram, you will see all sides of the object. A hologram is a photographic recording of a light field. There are two different laser beams involved, and when they reach the recording medium, their light waves intersect and interfere with each other. It is this interference pattern that is imprinted on the recording medium. The interference pattern can be considered an encoded version of the scene, available to view later only when a laser, identical to the one used to record the hologram, is shined on the recording medium. Now this is quite interesting. We are used to the paradigm of photographs. If I tear one in half, you can only see half the picture. But with holograms, it is different. If the hologram is broken and only a piece of the recording plate exists, the whole scene is still visible, but with slightly less definition. It's not as sharp and clear, but it is a faithful image nonetheless. The Bible is written in a similar fashion. It is not like our textbooks in school. If you want to find out what, for example, baptism is, or say how a certain ritual would be carried out, there is no single chapter devoted to that one topic. If you want to study any particular subject, you are going to have to read through the whole book, sifting and sorting, classifying and categorizing, until you have a complete picture. Sometimes in your study you will find a verse that seemed irrelevant before, but suddenly it fits into the overall scheme. Pretty clever of God to trick you into reading his whole book, huh? When we talk about understanding the full counsel of God, it is not only about finding all the tidbits related to a theme or a person. The study forces us to set our eyes on different points, which brings the multidimensionality of the Word into view. That process intrinsically brings the Word to life. Chuck Missler used to tell the story of a lowest caste Indian worker who cleaned the latrine. Now, in these latrines, they use the Bible for toilet paper. It's thin, and it's considered to be of no value. The worker found such a page, and upon reading it, believed in Yeshua, and he became born again and was overjoyed. What page did he find? Maybe the third chapter of John, or maybe Genesis chapter 1. No, it was a page from First Chronicles. Begat, begat, begat. Truly, the word does have life. To perceive the holographic nature of the Bible, you need the same light source that originally designed it and printed it, and that is the Holy Spirit. He will come and he will illuminate for you what it is that you're reading. Both the magic eye vision and the holographic vision of the Bible are reflected in this scripture from Isaiah 28.10. For precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little. The vision slowly comes into focus as the images and light sources from different angles are received and coordinated by the brain. The ironic thing about this scripture is that it is repeated once in verse 10 and once in verse 13, but the two repetitions carry different tones. Let's listen to it in Hebrew. Tzav l'tzav, tzav l'tzav, kav l'kav, kav l'kav, za'er sham, za'er sham. The prophet is talking to the backslidden people of his day. Who may be taught? He asks. Those who that are weaned from milk. They have some learning, and now they might proceed. Precept upon precept. Tzav l'tzav. Line upon line. Kav l'kav. One scripture here, and another there. Za'er sham. Za'er sham. That they may learn how to interpret. The rabbis have a name for this method. It is called stringing pearls. But the people of verse 12 do not take to heart the teaching. To whom he said, This is the rest wherewith ye may cause the weary to rest, and this is the refreshing. Isaiah gives the method 
And he says, it will refresh you to study like this. But the verse continues, yet they would not hear. Studying Torah is refreshing, but not if you are not willing to listen to it. In verse 13, it is written, And so the word of Jehovah was unto them, precept upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little, bringing about this result, that they might go and fall backward and be broken and snared and taken. Now maybe you can hear the mocking tone in the childish rhyme. Tav tav, tav tav, tav tav, tav tav. The people are not interested in the teaching. They are not interested in the learning of Torah. All of this also teaches us that we should not take scriptures out of context. One verse by itself can be skewed to make it fit our paradigm. We have nothing to measure it by, nothing to balance it by. However, when we take all of it together, we can see the three-dimensional maybe even the four-dimensional picture of Yehovah's universe. We are moving through time To His kingdom without end